Rivers Church, it's Don Cherie Wilkerson right here in Miami, and I cannot wait to be with you in just a few weeks for Sisters of Africa Conference. I'm really believing it's going to be a life-changing weekend in God's presence, so make sure you get registered because it won't be the same without you. I'll see you soon. And we keep our dreams alive. Sisters of Africa Women's Conference is less than two weeks away and we can't wait to welcome you for three incredible days worshipping, receiving, connecting and believing. So book your seat after this service today and make sure your little ones are registered for Kids Africa Conference too. Plus, next Sunday, you'll be able to check in early for conference before and after our morning services. Check in early to get your conference wristband so that you can come to conference at avoid the rush. You'll also have a chance to get your hands on some of our brand new Sisters of Africa apparel at the Sisters Market. We can't wait to see your beautiful faces at Sisters of Africa 2022. Wonderful to be in the house of the Lord and I'm so enjoying how God is working on our campuses as we rebuild. His presence has been unmistakable. As I open this morning, I've been reading a wonderful book called Triumph of Faith by a man called Rodney Stark. Incredibly encouraging because he says, contrary to what people are saying in the world, faith is growing, Christianity isn't declining, and people are more religious than they've ever been. In the book, he, however, quotes an interesting story that I want to begin with today. He talks about a priest called Thorkild Grosbill who is a priest of the Danish church in a place called uh, T-Bike, which is just uh, north of Copenhagen. And in 2003, he says this man published a book explaining that he did not believe in God anymore, even though he was a priest. Well, this attracted the attention of a newspaper, and uh, a national newspaper did an interview with Grospel, and he said this, he said, God belongs in the past. He is actually so old-fashioned that I'm baffled by modern people believing in his existence. I am thoroughly fed up with empty words about miracles and eternal life. Well, this national newspaper got the attention of the New York Times who interviewed him, and he said to them, I do not believe in a physical God, in the afterlife, in the resurrection, in the Virgin Mary, and I believe Jesus was only a nice guy. Well, that would be bad enough. Here's the problem. Grospel went on to continue as a priest in the Danish church, and he was uh, then, uh, you know, went through like a process of renewing his vows. He went to ecclesiastical court, and they found nothing against him serving as a priest. He reconfirmed his priestly vows and did not recant any of his views. He was just only asked not to speak to the press. In the book, Rodney Stark says this, and I want you to note this as we wrap up this particular portion here. He says, this was not a freak event. The Scandinavian state churches have been flirting with irreligion for at least a century. Do you know that despite Christianity growing, there are many people even in this building, in this church, in Kailami, and watching me speak this morning, who are putting aside their faith People have been losing their faith and reconstituting their faith. In fact, the word that's become popular today is called deconstructing, especially amongst young people, millennials, we are deconstructing. We used to call it backsliding, but now it's got a modern term. Many give up their faith, they turn away, and here's the strange thing, they are applauded. Now the Bible tells us that this will happen before the Antichrist comes, in 2 Thessalonians, it talks about the great apostasy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when you've got time to read it, there will be a great turning away and a great falling away. And today I've decided to encourage you because if you think you're standing, 1 Corinthians 10 says, take heed lest you fall. I want to speak to you today, and I've entitled the message, How Not to Lose Your Faith. How Not to Lose Your Faith. And I'm not going to speak about you reading the Bible. I might mention it. In fact, right at the end. But I want to speak about a few things that cause us to lose our faith. And I'm going to give you eight remedies. But before we get there, I want to point out to you what's happening in the world. Maybe you can identify with it if you're struggling with your faith today. Katy Perry was raised in an evangelical home. Her father was a preacher. She spent the majority of her time in church. 
and uh, was even wanting to become a gospel singer, traveled all the way to Nashville and decided that she was going to record an album. But she made a decision at 17 that transformed her life. She went to LA in order to improve her career in show business. Well, she quickly rose to fame. And in 2008, she became infamous for the song, I Kissed a Girl. And that had a massive impact on her career. It changed her trajectory and her path. And she turned away from serving God. She did a Marie Claire interview in which she said, I don't believe in a heaven or a hell or an old man sitting on a throne. I believe in a higher power bigger than me because that keeps me accountable. I wonder if you're in the room this morning and you think that and you think that's okay. That's not the faith. That's a kind of a faith. And I want to just say faith is not positive thinking. Faith is not wishing. Faith is not psyching yourself up. I believe, I believe. It will happen, it will happen. The universe will be good to me. That's not faith. Faith is agreeing with what God says. Amen. Kathy Griffin is a comedian and actress and quite a repugnant person, if I might say. She was raised in a Catholic home, but she disliked organized religion during her years in elementary school uh, because of the punishment that the nuns dished out. And can I just say... I had that in sub A and sub B. I had my hands glowing. And then I went to high school and I was caned, but I haven't turned out too badly. <laughs> Nonetheless, she, in an, in an uh, interview, uh, when she made headlines, in fact, at the Emmy Awards, sorry, she, in 2007, she was on stage and uh, she said this, a lot of people come up here and thank Jesus for this award. I want you to know that no one had less to do with this award than Jesus. Suck it, Jesus. This award is my God now. In fact, it was so shocking that they edited out of the broadcast, you know, slightly delayed. They cut that out. But this is what she said. This is the kind of people some of you admire and look to for advice. Julia Roberts, she was born in the Bible Belt to a Catholic mother and a Baptist father, raised as a Christian, serving God. However, she changed her religion to Buddhism after she did the movie Eat, Pray, Love because it fitted with her yoga exercises. Wait, it gets worse. Orlando Bloom. You love these people. Born and raised a Catholic, attended a Methodist primary school and uh, a Catholic educational institute. But he also changed to Buddhism. In 2004, he opened his own Buddhist center in, uh, in uh, LA. And by the way, of all the religions that are growing in the world, the only one that's shrinking is Buddhism. Because people don't need to follow it formally. They can follow it in magazines and they can have bits and pieces of it and it suits them. So it's a faith of your own making. But he's turned away and not only has he turned away, here's the thing, he got other people to turn away. Miranda Kerr adopted his practices and his ex-girlfriend Kate Bosworth converted to, Buzzle, to Buddhism. You know what causes us to lose our faith? It's not just a change of beliefs. It's often hardship and our desires. I want what I want, and I'm, I can't understand why there's suffering in the world. But Jesus spoke about this, and as we open this message this morning, before I get to give you the eight remedies, notice this verse in Matthew chapter 24, just so that you understand that this is common. And do you remember what happened when Judas went through suffering? He didn't get the position he'd hoped for. He didn't get the money and the political clout he'd hoped for. What happened to him? He lost his faith and committed suicide. Someone who spent three years with the Son of God and saw miracles. It's not impossible to lose your faith. And some of you right now, your faith is waning, and I'm going to encourage you to strengthen what remains. Matthew chapter 24, all nations will hate you because you are committed to me. Intolerance. Then many will lose faith. They will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive Many people, I want you to note that many false prophets don't be surprised when pastors and leaders and priests abuse children. Why are you surprised? I don't know how the church, Jesus said it would happen. They would be false people who would deceive you. Are you with me? Don't lose your faith over them. Keep your eyes on him. And then it says, and then there will be more and more lawlessness. Like South Africa, most people's love will grow cold. But the person who endures to the end will be saved. Don't turn on each other. Don't betray each other. Don't get your eyes on people. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And deceptive people, listen to me, deceptive, betraying people, even pastors, and circumstances must not get you to lose your faith. How many of you remember an actor called Gabriel Byrne from Dublin? 
You know, he grew up as a Catholic. And you know what the challenge was? Two brothers abused him while he was serving in the church. He then continued and pressed through and went to seminary. And while he was at seminary, one of the priests abused him. He's turned his back on God and become an atheist. And he's very outspoken now against the church. And when people listen to him, they are swayed by him. And uh, his faith has been lost. And he calls the Catholic Church now a force for evil in the world. And he compared it to the Nazi party. And he's now a proud atheist and speaks against the church frequently. You've got to be careful that your heart doesn't get turned by what people do. Another verse here, Matthew chapter 18, I want, to, I want to show you Jesus said this would happen. If it's happening to you, it's not unusual. If you're a young person in the room today, maybe you're under 25, and, you, and, you, and you're figuring all this stuff out. It's not new. I was there. Many others have been there. Jesus said we would be there. We need to hold on until he comes. He warns us here, how terrible for the world that there are things to make people lose their faith. Fact. Such things will always happen, but are terrible for the one who causes them. Then he talks to us personally. Takes his, take our eyes off people. He says, if your hand or your foot makes you lose your faith, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life without a hand or foot and to keep both hands and both feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eyes make you lose your faith, take it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter life with only one eye than to keep both eyes and to be thrown into the fire of hell. Radical measures, radical remedies are needed if you are going to retain your faith. Are you with me? This requires everything you've got. So let me give you some remedies that might surprise you. Number one, the first thing you need to do so that you don't lose your faith is don't try to understand and fix everything. We try and understand why there's suffering and death and grief and loss and pain in the world, but there's much that we don't know. And if you're making notes this morning, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the Lord speaks to the children of Israel and he says, when you're blessed, you must tell people it's me. When you're cursed, you must tell people it's because you were disobedient. And then he says in verse 29, but the secret things belong to God. There's stuff you can't figure out that you'll only find out in eternity. And obedient people can also suffer terrible hardship and unfair things. One day we'll go to heaven. We're not there right now. It's almost like we have the, you, you, know, you know when it rains in Johannesburg, you know it rains. But sometimes, like if you go to Cape Town, you get what's called drizzle. It's annoying. All it does is make your hair crisp, ladies, and it messes up your clothes, but it doesn't actually water the garden. We are now experiencing the drizzle of God's blessing, not the rain. One day we will experience the showers of His blessing. And you know, when you read the Psalms, you'll see that the psalmist, especially David, understood something called antimony. Antimony, it's, a, it's an interesting term. It's an apparent incompatibility between two apparent truths. There's a tension. God heals and sometimes He doesn't. There's light and there's darkness. There's sin and there's righteousness. There's, uh, there's uh, healing and then there's, there's, uh, there's suffering. There's pain and then there's deliverance. There's love and then there's judgment. There are tensions. And the psalmist understood, and I love what Psalm 131, the psalmist says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. You know what the psalmist is saying in the psalm? I let go of stuff I don't understand because it could take me away from God and I could lose my faith. If you've got stuff that you don't understand, I have. I've got a few things. But overall, I know the Savior died and rose from the dead. And that can't change what I feel, can't change what happens to me. You have to press on. The last person I'll mention today by way of illustration is Brad Pitt. He was raised in a charismatic Baptist family. And he sang in the choir. And at a 2011 Cannes Film Festival, he made this comment because he can't figure stuff out. He said, many people find religion to be very inspiring. Myself, I find it very stifling. I grew up with Christianity, and I remember questioning it greatly. Nothing wrong with questioning. I grew up being told God is going to take care of everything, and it doesn't always work out that way. And then you're told, well, it's God's will. I've got my issues, man. You don't want to get me started. How many in the room? Don't put your hand up. How many in the room? How many in the room at Kyle Army? You got your issues. You got questions. You need to press on and not try and answer everything and try and fix everything because we can't fix things. We're living under the fall. 
And if the more you try and understand it, the harder it'll be for you. You've got to recognize that God is alive, that he lives and he sent his son. His son said that he would die for our sins. He did and he rose again. And that's what we've got to hold on to, not all the peripheral things and our comfort. Ecclesiastes 7 warns us. It says, think about what God has done. How can anyone straighten out what God has made crooked? When things are going well for you, be glad. And when trouble comes, just remember, God sends both happiness and trouble. And you never know what's going to happen next. You can't control it. And while we live life and we have responsibility, and while God is sovereign and he does things, I love, I love that the two, even though they seem opposite, we, we've got responsibility, then God will do what he wants. We've got to pray and ask for healing, but sometimes God doesn't heal. It's like, well, then why pray? No, he tells us to pray. Yeah. I love this quote by this theologian, and I'll wrap up this point. Joel Beek, he's an American theologian. He says this, just as the rails of a train track run parallel to each other, and appear to merge in the distance, so the doctrines of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, which seem separate from each other in this life, will merge in eternity. There's a lot you don't know now, but you will know later. Hold on to your faith, and don't try to understand and fix everything. Number two, don't inordinately rely on people. You see, if people fail, then you fail. Don't rely on me. I could fail you. By God's grace, I hope I won't. But people stumble when especially key leaders fall into sin. Do you know that they get tempted? Do you think that when you go into the ministry, something happens to you, omnipartris, and now you're not tempted anymore? You put your hope in people, it's going to destroy your faith. You need to tell yourself that no matter what happens, you'll serve the Lord. No matter what people do. If Pastor Andre goes and leaves his wife and leaves the ministry and becomes, uh, chooses some other religion or starts smoking dope again and sniffing cocaine and listening to rock music, you're not going to go that way. You're going to serve the Lord. Amen. You see, I said you don't inordinately rely on people. So you have to rely on people, otherwise you have no relationships. But it mustn't go beyond the limits. It mustn't be something where you're overly dependent on people. And uh, we end up losing our faith. Can I say, don't be overly dependent on your husband or wife because they could die on you. What are you going to do then? I don't know how I'm going to go on. Where is God? Why did God let this happen? Did you think your husband or wife was never going to die? Did God ever promise you that? No. The way of the earth, all flesh will die. And some die young, some die old. We've got to trust God despite what happens to the people around us, despite what the people around us do. Are you listening to me this morning, Kailami? Don't inordinately rely on people. And sometimes we can believe in God, but we end up taking people as our strength. We've got a head belief, but people are our strength. Phone up people all the time. How are you? You didn't call me. Where were you yesterday? And I called you three times. Didn't you get the missed calls? It's a time like that you just need to put the phone aside. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Come on now. You see, Jeremiah warned us in Jeremiah 17. He says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. Never make flesh or a person or money your strength. Keep the Lord as your hub. And then no matter what happens, you will continue to serve him. No matter what they do, if your spouse leaves you for another, uh, another woman or another man, your world won't fall apart. You keep coming to church. They're choosing to do that. God is still on the throne. I'm going to serve him. Your husband or wife dies. They've gone to be with the Lord. If they didn't know the Lord, but my life is still here, God's got a plan for me. How not to lose your faith is not to inordinately put your hope in people. And don't... You can clap. Don't look at the world and see how they don't come to church on Sundays and drive out in their convertibles or their four by fours with their family off to a braai. And they look like they, they don't need God because some people get that illusion as Christians. Like they're just like us. They're decent. No, they're not. They're different to you. A psalmist, Asaph, who was a worship leader, by the way, wrote Psalm 73. And he, songwriter, worshiper, was phased 
And I want to read you, I can't read the whole psalm, but he says this. He says, God is indeed good to Israel, to those who have pure hearts. But I had nearly lost my confidence. My faith was almost gone. Because I was jealous of the proud. When I saw things going well for the wicked, they do not suffer pain. Yeah, they hide it. They are strong and healthy. They do not suffer as other people do. They do not have the troubles that others do. David compares, or sorry, Asaph compares his hardship. Uh, I'm having hardship. I'm a Christian. I tithe. I come to Rivers Church. I'm involved in children's church. I'm a connect group leader. And look, what, Lord, my husband died young. Here she sits. Well done, Anusha. Pressing on. Husband died of a heart attack at an age you shouldn't have, but she's not lost her faith. She's had times of wavering, but pressing on. That's what you've got to do. That's what you've got to do. Amen. Number three, this is what you're going to do. If you don't want to lose your faith, know that doubts will always arise. Even people who serve God for years, occasionally a doubt will arise. Thomas was with Jesus for three years. He saw miracles. He saw dead people raised but he could not believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. That's why he's called Doubting Thomas. And uh, Jesus said to them in Luke 24, when he met with them, he said this, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. See, doubts arise. They lie dormant, but they can arise. And when they do, I mean, what's this? Maybe I'm getting older. Maybe I'm more mature now. No, you're an idiot. Shut up. Get rid of that doubt. Lay hold of the Savior. See his hands. See his feet. Get your eyes on him. We are weird. It's, it's, doubt is like an enemy, but we entertain it. Come, let me, let me examine you and deconstruct you and play with you. And I'm all going to church this morning. I don't play with doubt. Get it out quickly. I want to serve the Lord. Stay on track with him. And you've got to recognize that when you have doubt, the enemy is coming to test you. You know, what you, you know what the devil said to Eve? You've got to remember these words. Did God say? Did God really say? Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe you're. You've got to know what you believe. And when doubts arise, you've got to deal with them. And your faith will be tested. And uh, Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, come boldly, O believer. For despite the whisperings of Satan and the doubtings of thine own heart, thou art greatly beloved. You will doubt God's forgiveness. You will doubt God's goodness. You will doubt God's plan. And Satan will whisper. And you've got to deal with doubt. Even Peter doubted. Doubted that he would make it. Doubted that Jesus was the Son of God. And Jesus spoke to him about it. Now what you notice the words he uses, because we must not think we're above this. Luke chapter 22 Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. This is the leader of the 12. He's been with Jesus for three years in intimate conversation on the Mount of Transfiguration. And when you have turned back from your doubts, strengthen your brothers. Do you know what causes doubt in our minds mostly, and this is what my experience has shown me, is suffering. Pain and suffering is, some of the hard, is one of the hardest things to deal with, grief as well. But pain and suffering make you doubt God. And C.S. Lewis, when his wife died, she wasn't healed, he prayed for her. It caused him incredible grief and pain. And he ended up writing a book called The Problem of Pain. But stay with me here. In the book he says this, and this is a profound statement that I want you to hold on to today. He says, the problem of pain teaches us that our existential suffering does not and cannot cancel out the historical truth of the resurrection of Jesus our Lord. No matter what I experience and no matter what I go through and no matter how I hurt, no matter what accident you're involved in, no matter what happens to your loved ones, Jesus died and rose from the dead and he's alive. What are you going to do with that? If you focus on your suffering and your personal pain and your comfort, you'll try and erase the historical fact that Jesus is alive. We've got to be people who know that doubts will arise. Number four, are you still with me this morning? Are you with me in Kailami? I hope you're benefiting from the word today. We can't turn the clock back. Stop trying to change what is. 
You can't turn the clock back. If only, and this is what people say, if only God had stopped that. My wife or husband divorced me, and you know, we were in church for years tithing. Why didn't God? Well, God's in heaven right now, and we're on the earth under the fall. There's only a drizzle, not the rain showers. H.G. Wells wrote that book years ago, and I think it's a desire of the heart, The Time Machine. Do you remember that? That famous book in the 1800s. I made movies out of it. It's a movie about time travel. Why does he write a book about time travel? Because his fiance was killed in an accident and his desire was to go back and try and fix it. How many of you have got regrets today? You wish you could go back. If only, if only the Lord was there when my husband died, my wife died, when that accident happened and those children were killed. If only he sent an angel. Where was God? And we keep asking if only. That's what Mary and Martha did when Jesus came. Lord, if you had been here. You can't turn the clock back. We've got to, you, do you know, 20, 25% of the Bible is about the future. That means we've got to live our lives forward. We've got to live our lives backwards. And if you keep trying to turn the clock back, you will only frustrate yourself. People ask, why didn't God show up? Why didn't God prevent that from happening? And this is what I've heard women say. I, I slept with a guy. Why didn't God stop me from falling pregnant? Now I'm pregnant and I don't have a husband. You can't turn the clock back. And now it's not time to lose your faith. If you're pregnant out of marriage and you've done something that you know you shouldn't have done, now's the time to hold on to God because you've got a child to raise in the faith. Yeah. You know, we want God to bless our mess. Do you remember what, what uh, Isaac said to the Lord? He, the Lord said to him, you're going to have a son. But he took Hagar. See, he tried to fix it. I'm going I'm to help God along. And in Genesis chapter 17, he says to the Lord, will Sarah be a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. In other words, if only you'd bless my mess. God says, no, you can't turn the clock back. You've done that. I've got a greater purpose for your life. Let's move along. Number five, here's the thing that you need to remember so that your faith will not fail and you won't lose your faith. Trouble will not destroy us. If there's one thing that'll test your faith, it's trouble. Life can be bad, but listen, not beyond your ability to cope. That's what the Bible says, and I believe what God says. There's been times when you're in anguish, when you're emotional, when you feel like you, 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 you can't go on. Paul experienced that. His life was bad. He describes what he experienced, but he says he was not destroyed. And you've got to believe that no matter what happens to you, you can come out the other end. Notice here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and many of you know all these verses so well, but this is our focus today. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Your body, your makeup is clay. You've been made of the earth. You are weak and vulnerable, but in you is the treasure of God. That's the tension. That's the antimony, if you like. And he says, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed. Are you hard pressed today? We are. But I love what he says. On every side but not crushed. I'm being squeezed by people, by money, by this, by that. My boss, my husband, my wife, my kids, by loss. But I'm not crushed. I'm not crushed. I love that. He says perplexed, but not in despair. And I'm confused. What do I do? What decision do I make? Which way do I go? Someone could help me. But I'm not in despair. And then he says, persecuted, but not abandoned. People can be against me on social media. They can put me, my sermon clips on television. They can print posters on the poll, racist pastor, but I'm not in despair and I'm not abandoned. People will persecute you even when you're not doing anything wrong. You've got to press on. God loves you. And then he says, struck down. You struck down today? You might be, but not destroyed. Don't lie on the ground and lose your faith and give up on God. Realize that trouble will not destroy us and we need to press on. And you know what happens to us when we have trouble if we don't deal with it correctly? It starts to become the theme of your life. Hear me, hear me today. 
Many of you are negative, and it's very easy to become negative. During COVID, it was even more easy to become negative, and if your personality leans to that, mine does on occasions. I see problems, and I, as a leader, I'm looking for problems to fix, and so sometimes you can become negative. You have to be careful. It doesn't become the theme of your life. Everything that comes out of your mouth is negative. And you know, when suffering happens, that can happen to you. When Job went through suffering, listen to this. This is a profound verse that you might want to note. And Job chapter 30 and verse 31, look what he says about his life. My lyre is tuned to mourning and my pipe to the sound of wailing. In other words, I have tuned my life to play, to play in C flat and D minor. How many of you, don't put your hands up, have met people like that? Their life is tuned to C flat and D minor. Why? Because trouble came and they changed the tune and now they strung that way. You've got to be careful that you're not strung to negativity and that you hold on in faith to the Lord. Number six, remember, we won't always feel like this. I mean, our feelings can be incredibly strong. I feel I'm going to explore other religions. You won't always feel like that. When someone dies, how could God do this? I'll never get over it. Yeah, you might not get over it, but you will get past it. We've got to believe that we won't always feel like this. Feelings can be powerful. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, says, Faith, in the sense in which I'm using the word, is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. That's what faith is. Faith says, no matter how I feel, this is what I believe. That is why faith is such a necessary virtue. Unless you teach your moods where they get off, you can never either be a sound Christian or even a sound atheist. Feelings. But I feel this way. To, I can't live without her. I can't live without him. You can. Come to me and I'll slap you and I'll tell you you can. You know, a slap in the face is sometimes a shock us into reality because we become like children. You see someone and you get all weird and you go all red and you behave all odd and you... I can't, I, know. I think it's the Lord, you know. And, and listen to me, all of you in Kyle Army, anyone listening to my voice and in this room, don't tell yourself this story. I was young when I got married. Now that I'm older, I really know who I want. You are talking nonsense. You cannot live your life according to feeling. None of us can decide to live according to feelings. Feelings, desires will lead you up the garden path. Yeah, but I was born like this, and, I, and, I, and now I've got to express it. No, you don't. If you express your desires, you become like an animal. That's all animals do all day. They wake up and they eat. Then they stop and they pee. Then they walk along and then they defecate. Then they eat. You cannot live like that. You have to live by principle. Your head is lifted to heaven in worship. You control yourself. That's what makes us different. We're creative. We can paint paintings. We can do heart operations. We are unique under God. Can't let feelings rule us, and your feelings will pass. Listen to me. You don't have to have that car. I'm praying, and I'm believing for a breakthrough, and come, agree with me. No, no, no. You can't make a decision based on feelings. You've got to make it based on budget. It's funny how we bring God into everything. And I buy this car, I believe it's for me. Yes, I'm the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. I declare it's mine. You agree with me. Everybody else around is going, you can't afford it. <laughs> now, you know I believe in God blessing you and prospering you. And then you lose your faith. God didn't come through for me. Guys, who's on the Lord's side? Before you want God on your side, get on His side. Amen? You've got to be very careful. Listen to me. If you're feeling something, like you're feeling suicidal, or you're feeling like you want to make a rash decision, be very careful. Do not make a permanent decision about a temporary problem. You have got to make a decision that's going to, you can live with, but if you make a permanent decision like suicide because you've got a temporary problem that you feel depressed, you're making a bad decision. You will not always feel this way. Hold on to your faith. And hold on to the Lord. I love what D.L. Moody said. He said, take courage. We walk in the wilderness today and in the promised land tomorrow. Isn't that great? God turns things around. 
And the psalmist says here in Psalm 30, his anger lasts only a moment, but his goodness lasts for a lifetime. Tears may flow in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And then I love what he says again in the NLT in verse 11 of Psalm 30. You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy. We walk by faith, never by sight, never by desire, never by feelings, always by principle. Has this helped you today? Number seven, this is important to remember so that you don't lose your faith. This is a thing that can discourage us. No one ever arrives, we all fall short. Keep going and don't camp at your failures. I remember many years ago, I was already in the ministry and I started noticing there were things in my life that were still there. I was kind of thinking, why aren't they gone? I'm praying, I'm reading the Bible, I'm walking with the Lord, I'm being used of Him, and surely by this time I should have been over it. And I realized you're never going to, there's always going to be an Achilles heel. There's always going to be an area where the devil's going to tempt you. You're always going to be susceptible, even though you love the Lord. You're not a hypocrite. You're not, a, you're not living a double life. There, there's, there's a place where the enemy comes, he pricks and he pokes. How many of you can relate to that in the room? In Carl Army today, I'm sure you all understand this. You see, Peter was, was a person that was at the fire, remember? And they said, surely you're with him. No, I know not the man. And guess what happened? When Peter began to minister to the Gentiles, and he spent time with the Gentiles, the minute the Jews came, he pulled away. Book of Galatians tells us he, he pulled away. And Paul says, hey, hey, come here, you. What are you doing? You're behaving like a hypocrite. You see, the same tendencies, if you're not careful, they come out and then they discourage you. Oh, I'm just giving up. I can't do this. No, this is just, this is what people say. This is just me. Yeah, we know you. I know me. You do not want to know me. People say, be true to yourself. No, no, don't. We don't want to see it. <laughs> no, no, if you're true to yourself, we wouldn't be in this building. Huh? If I told you what I was thinking, you'd be like, what? That's all of us. And we never arrive. And we must m move on. And uh, we must encourage ourselves. The, the hardest people are people who strive for excellence because you become a perfectionist. Then you're hard on people. Sometimes you're hard on yourself and God is on you. And the Apostle Paul said this in Philippians 3. You all know this so well, I'm sure. I do not claim that I've already succeeded or have already become perfect. I keep striving to win the prize for which Christ Jesus already won me to himself. Keep going. Rely on grace and stop expecting people and yourself to be perfect. It's a journey until we enter heaven. That's why the Bible is honest. It doesn't hide anything. Max Lucado, in talking about the honesty of the Bible, he says this, perfect people, no. Perfect messes, you bet. Yet God used them. A surprising and welcome discovery of the Bible is this, God uses failures. Stop looking for perfect people in yourself, in others, in your husband or wife. Stop trying to trade in your husband or wife. Stop looking for perfect churches. You will never find them. You shouldn't inordinately rely on people anyway. You should rely on God. And number eight, this morning, you can clap if you want. There's an urge. They're clapping here. I don't know if Carl Omi is excited. But number eight, as we wrap up this message this morning, this is what you need to remember. God's plan for our lives is not always comfortable. One of the biggest issues in our world today is people want to be comfortable. They want to be happy. Any feelings of pain or discomfort are considered not to be God or can't be God because God is a God of love. But everybody in the Bible, if we study the Bible carefully from the book of Job, you can see there's pain. And the life of a consistent, committed Christian can be very uncomfortable at times. Job was accused by Satan. Do you remember? He only serves you because you love him and you look after him and you bless him. See, while he's comfortable, he'll serve you. But at times when it's not comfortable, that's when we show our faith. And we press on. Joseph, he wasn't comfortable. God had a plan. And that plan was not up, up, up. It was down, down, down. Are you going down, down, down right now? Hold on to your dreams. Hold on to the promise of God. It might be uncomfortable, but it might be part of the journey. Hmm? You've got to remember that. And the Apostle Paul faced plenty of discomfort and challenges in his life, but he pressed on and served the Lord. You see, church, as I wrap up this morning,
before I hand over to Kyle Lamy. If you lose your faith, this is what happens. Very often you don't choose another faith. You end up believing in nothing. G.K. Chesterton put it like this. He said, the danger of loss of faith in God is not that one will believe in nothing, but rather that one will believe in anything. You know, interestingly enough, I quoted Katy Perry. In the article I read about it, it goes on to say this. She's very interested in joining the secret organization called the Illuminati because she finds it very exciting. When you lose faith, you take your eyes off God, you end up going down a bad road, and you end up believing in anything. Let's not lose our faith. Let's honor God. Let's serve him. Let's continue to trust him and build our faith. Jude says we must build up our faith. Faith just left to itself deteriorates, but you've got to build it up and then you'll stand strong in Jesus' name. Let me hand back to Carl Lamy this morning, and Kogi is there. She will pick up the rest of the meeting. Now, as we close here this morning, church, what I want to say to you is, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You've got to get good doses of the Word if you want to build your faith. And Jude verse 20 says, build your faith up. In, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. And so here's the thing. If you live on snacks, you're not going to be strong. You're not going to be healthy. You, 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 you can't eat titbits. You need a good diet. And then that good diet will strengthen you. And you won't lose your faith. And uh, we have a thing called the faith. Have you noticed that? The Bible doesn't just talk about faith. It talks about the faith. And conversion is when you come to faith in Jesus. In fact, if you study the book of Acts, and I'll tell you this quickly as I wrap up here. I've got a few more minutes. If you study the book of Acts, and I'm sharing this with the staff, you'll notice that there's a story that's repeated word for word three times. Then as you go on, there's another story that's repeated two times, word for word. And when you find something like it in the Bible, the writer, Luke, he is not like forgotten, he's just told the story. The Holy Spirit is saying, I want you word for word to write this because I don't want anyone to forget this is a prime. And all this history and their travels and all the miracles, this has got to be retained from the book of Acts. Guess what it is? The first one is Paul's conversion. Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26, word for word, where he met Jesus on the road and he gave his life to Christ and the scales fell off his eyes and he began to serve the Lord. And then the next one is Acts chapter 10, where Cornelius, uh, Peter rather, before Cornelius, gets the vision of the sheet and he's sent to the Gentiles to teach them so that they can get converted. Then when he gets to the house, just like a couple of verses later, he walks into the house of Cornelius, the Gentile, and the Gentiles are now getting converted, and the story is repeated again, word for word. We, and I'm thinking to myself when I've read it, Luke, we just read it. But the Holy Spirit's saying conversion, salvation is of prime importance. It's a marker. And I want to ask you today, have you drifted away from that? Have you lost a bit of faith and are you, are you waning? And have you made faith in Jesus a conversion? Have you made that decision? You must make it because that's the defining thing that determines whether we go to heaven. We can't earn it. It's simply believing in the blood of Jesus. Am I making sense this morning? You know, I woke up at 4.15 this morning. I've not been sleeping well lately, but it's actually been quite good because I get up and I pray and I pray like I don't pray during the day. It's been like a special time with the Lord. And uh, I, I was, I was uh, lying on the couch. I wasn't at my desk. I like to change the location. I'm lying on the couch and I'm noticing there's a bright light shining through the blind. So I pull up the blind and you know, they tilted. I, I opened it and I looked and the moon was full. It was like this. It was like this. It was like this. It was like that. The moon. Okay. Did you know this morning, any of you got up early, it was full moon. It was full moon. And here's the amazing thing. You know, as I looked at it, I was like, that's how I'm going to close the meeting today. The moon does not have any light of its own. If the moon tries, it can't shine. It won't shine. If the moon turns, it won't shine. The only time the moon shines is when the sun the S-O-N shines on it. And you and I can't do anything of our own works. 
We can't improve our lives. We can't believe stronger. We've just got to get back in the light of the sun and reflect Him. If we do that, God will be well pleased with us. Come close your eyes.